uh, Lynn is going to talk to us about how we are actually going to get from there to uh, get there from here, how we're actually going to get um, enterprises thinking about big data scientifically and uh, thinking about uh, enterprise data adoption. Lynn, over to you. All right, great. I hope that everyone can hear me. I'm calling in over Skype from Paris where I'm doing some training around uh, big data. So um, hopefully everyone can hear me properly. Uh, so I'm Find going to right. talk about trends that I see out in the enterprise in terms of big data. I've got this deck available, um, so I'm going to go relatively quickly because of time. Uh, through Twitter and through my blog, which is the same uh, address. So the first thing that I'm seeing out in the enterprise big data world is very few, if any, of the enterprises are uh, um, working with anything other than the current data uh, because, as some of the previous speakers said, of the perceived cost or the actual cost of storing data. So what I see in, in the enterprise is um, enterprises are working with transactional data and answering questions like uh, if it's a sales scenario, what did we sell, when did we sell it, so on and so forth. Um, I see very, very rarely uh, use of data mining other than in specialty industries um, such as financial or, or medical records that have had a long history of such. Although there are data mining tools available, it's just not something that I see very, very often used in the industry. So how do we get from where we are now to incorporating big data into uh, BI? Uh, I look at this through a lens of the storage, which uh, affects, uh, works with uh, processing, query, and presentation. And so the first area that uh, I, I think about and, and talk to clients about is uh, the cloud. So the cloud enables us to uh, scale not only the uh, amount of data that we can store, but also processing and queries, and um, actually also presentation. So it can impact any or all of the layers of data. And it's interesting to see um, the amount of startup activity as well as activity from traditional vendors like Microsoft um, in leveraging the cloud in moving um, BI to big data. So of course, sort of the first and obvious thing is uh, the use of NoSQL, and many speakers have talked about uh, NoSQL integrating with um, the existing big data. And quite interesting that in uh, October of this year, both Oracle and Microsoft shipped connectors uh, to their big RDBMS systems to Hadoop um, as sort of a first step. Uh, Microsoft also announced that uh, they will uh, be making available a connector directly in Excel. Um, and I actually have that, um, probably because of time. Um, I won't have time to show that, but people can look at my blog. I'm, I'm working with the team um, on uh, helping customers to understand how to actually directly access group data via um, Excel and Power Pivot and some of the analytical tools. So in addition to uh, you know connecting to NoSQL, whether it's on-premise or in the cloud, um, the big vendors also, of course, have their own offering around storage in the cloud. So um, there's a plethora of information out there, and, and I find my customers to be quite confused. Each of the vendors, you know, starting with Microsoft, where I, I up till recently actually used to work, um, they have both relational offerings, uh, SQL Azure, um, as well as NoSQL offerings, although they're um, not very clear in communicating it. Windows Azure Tables is a type of a NoSQL. In addition, some of the vendors are providing um, additional services, like Microsoft is uh, uh, shipping uh, uh, reporting uh, in the cloud as well, so they're doing the, the processing in, in the cloud. Um, also on the um, presentation layer, there's, uh, as one of the speakers mentioned, there's a Windows Azure data market where um, customers can both access either public uh, data sets, such as uh, this one is, um, I think, uh, tourist information, or they can uh, advertise and publish their own uh, cloud-based data sets. They can, they can uh, advertise them and uh, make money on them. In addition to Microsoft's offerings, of course, you have the other big vendors out there. Amazon has uh, many different types of storage offerings from the, the NoSQL offerings all the way up to uh, versions of relational databases in the cloud. So customers have a lot to pick from in terms of figuring out what to store. 
um, Google, same thing, same um, breadth of offerings. They have uh, their own sort of proprietary engines that, that work with uh, the Google web apps. Um, recently, they've added relational storage in the cloud. So it's been kind of an interesting perspective. So some of the vendors came out with relational first, Microsoft, for example, in the cloud. Some came out with no SQL first and then added relational. Um, customers in the enterprise are generally relational, of course, so they're, they're, they're grasping this idea of, of what to use uh, no SQL for. The thing that's driving um, this interest is cost. Um, I recently did a blog post where I compared to my ability 100 gigabytes of storage, both relational and non-relational, um, on the current vendor offerings. And this is a story that is not, I don't think, easily ascertained when you're looking at a particular vendor, but I tried to be as, as, as diligent as possible. And my finding was that um, non-relational storage was 50 times cheaper than relational storage at current offerings uh, in the cloud. So, of course, businesses are in business to make money, so uh, this is going to be uh, Thing that everybody moves to because of cost, uh, but because of cost, they may now also look at bringing additional data uh, to their BI offering. So what might this data consist of and what might it look at? Many of the speakers alluded to this, but this is the way I look at it and explain it to customers. I say that you're currently uh, collecting transactional data, so what did happen? I usually make the example of uh, shopping, it's pretty simple. Uh, so I say, where, wh when did I buy my last pair of shoes, so on and so forth. What we now have the opportunity to do, because of the cheapness of storage, whether on-prem or in the cloud, is to collect behavioral data. So uh, an example that I use, um, in many cases now, uh, you can uh, have access to uh, customer behavior when they go to uh, a public shopping mall. So you can literally get their path through the mall, for example, and you could collect that sensorial data. And as many of the speakers talked about, you could then um, put it in a bucket and then uh, look at it for interesting analytical uh, possibilities, uh, mine it and process it and use it to add business value. So the sort of the big picture thing is I was collecting transactional data. Now, because of the cheapness and the flexibility of storage, I may want to look at collecting behavioral data. In addition to the uh, big players, we also have um, some interesting startups that are giving us some examples of what we might do with this. I've, I've found a Splunk has been an interesting one. They have a, a full online solution where um, you just connect to them and then they have suggestions about the types of data that you might want to look at. Um, and they apply not only um, the ability to upload, to so store, but also to process your uh, um, uh, uh, behavioral data, and they suggest behavioral data from your network. Of course, you can do anything, but they're trying to get you uh, understanding what services they provide. So you can upload, for example, your Windows um, event uh, log files from your, from your machines or your network, um, network capture information, and then they will data mine against that and provide meaning and present you with a dashboard. So interesting trend in the industry to um, leverage the uh, capacity uh, of the cloud in all the layers of the stack. Um, another one that has been interesting to me is uh, Freebase. There's, there's quite a lot of startup activity around this. One, one area of interest for enterprise customers is to be uh, aware of what's going on in the startup world in combination of, with what the, the, the traditional vendors are offering. So the first sort of trend is store more, uh, either in NoSQL, local, or in the cloud. The second thing that I see that's important for the enterprise, and this has been mentioned by other speakers, is how do we uh, either train or, or hire employees that are going to help us make sense of this information? Um, this is how I came into this world from traditional BI. I started uh, attending some of the, the new conferences that are popping up. Um, Data Scientist Summit was one of them. Um, uh, Strata Conference uh, as well. Also, there's some community efforts around cloud camps that are popping up. So uh, interestingly, of course, this has been said many times, uh, data science is the sort of hot next career um, and, and uh, many opportunities to, uh, to, to learn and, and uh, work in the data science area. I actually have a link in the slide if you've got some people that are actually programmers or developers, you can actually start practicing. So um, also O'Reilly has a pretty good data science starter kit that seems to be becoming a, a standard in the industry. 
the search. The second thing is if you are a um, data professional or a developer, um, just a great career opportunity is to um, expand your technical knowledge to include uh, data science. The third sort of area for the enterprise to pay attention to is new form factors. Um, I had direct experience with this being an internal beta tester for Microsoft Connect um, and seeing the impact of the Connect um, going much more broad uh, uh, than outside of the gaming world and, and moving into you know, the OS for Windows 8 and having all kinds of um, interesting possibilities for applications from the open source world who normally doesn't embrace, embrace enterprise development in any, in any way. Um, of course, also uh, the mobile um, uh, platform is a platform of, um, of interest for the enterprise for, for BI. I was reading a um, uh, summary that said that 33 percent of uh, enterprises were looking at, at bringing BI to the mobile platform. So um, looking at products or uh, learning technologies so that you can develop BI solutions on, on the mobile platform because the expectation is that um, access to this data, including the uh, behavioral data, will be uh, available on all your different devices is becoming quite common. Uh, because the, the, the way that you access this data is complex, there are vendors that are, are building layers on top of um, Hadoop, for example, Hortonworks, Cloudera are, are out there building um, tools and, and solutions to help this to be more accessible for people in the enterprise. It's something to look at both on-premise on, on these tools can be, or they can be uh, cloud, uh, in the cloud. This is an example of KarmaSphere running um, on top of uh, Hadoop, running MapReduce jobs, uh, making the data more accessible to people with more of an analytic skill bent than a, a developer skill bent. Uh, Microsoft, of course, uh, bases most of its uh, um, uh, BI uh, analytic uh, visualization through Excel. So it's uh, making an effort to uh, run uh, all of this new data through both Power Pivot as, uh, along with um, traditional Excel. We also have some other uh, vendors. Uh, Prediction is one that does an add-in for Excel that's doing um, cloud-based uh, data mining to help customers who are bringing in or mashing up these, this various data through Excel to help it be more usable and understandable. Also, there are other vendors out there uh, such as ClickView that um, are trying to provide interfaces to, to data so that um, business users can, again, transform this behavioral data into something that's meaningful. Uh, one thing that ClickView is particularly uh, strong on is uh, the ability to uh, present on the different form factors. They've been a leader on the iPad and they're presenting on, on these mobile form factors as well. So an important trend for, for enterprise is to pay attention to um, clients that can present on the, the form factors. So the three sort of big areas to pay attention to for the enterprise moving from BI to big data is uh, first uh, look into storing some of this behavioral data uh, on the cloud, probably in a, a NoSQL format because it's uh, substantially uh, more cost effective. Um, second is to process some of this data, use um, some of the, the canned um, stuff if you're new to data mining like Splunk or maybe prediction um, or get some of your people trained up in data science. Um, and the third is to update the client tools so that the client tools can uh, present this data to, to your users. Um, as I said, Microsoft is uh, presenting the um, Hadoop uh, connector for Excel. Uh, the team told me this will be a, a public beta coming up um, in the near future, so you'll want to watch Microsoft's site for that. Also, they released today a product called the Data Explorer, which um, I don't think I'm going to try to screen share because I'm, I'm on very limited bandwidth here. But it's called Data Explorer, and what it does is it's um, either a, a desktop client or it is a client and exposes what are traditionally um, ETL processes, so um, more so on the T, so transforming mashed up data. Um, and creating um, the opportunity for people with more domain knowledge, so analyst types, to take data and cleanse it, um, statistically sample it, and package it up for um, distribution to other uh, users of the enterprise. So give um, meaning to that behavioral data. So uh, I found this to be very useful. This is a, I, probably not readable because uh, of 
the resolution, but it's a comparison between BI and data science at a deeper level. So hopefully you'll find that, that useful. And then uh, just have a couple more things to finish up with. The uh, second to last thing here is, in addition to the work that I'm doing in the BI and data industry, I also run a, a nonprofit called Teaching Kids Programming because I have a strong belief that technologists should partner with educators to improve what is a technical education uh, for our children. And I will be adding courseware for children um, in 2012 to um, introduce kids to big data because I, I would like the next generation of data scientists to um, to uh, be prepared. So lots of information, not a lot of time, sorry ran over. Um, if you have questions, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer them. You can follow me on um, Twitter. You can follow my blog with my same name. Also, I've written three books on traditional data warehousing. So if you're trying to get up to speed on that, um, you can grab my latest book. Um, I have a link on, on Twitter. The book is 50% off as a um, companion to this talk. So thanks for listening in, and if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Hey, Lynn, that was great. Thank you, and uh, again, thank you for sticking with us. I know you had to jump through a bunch of hoops to get on this call from uh, Europe and all that other stuff via Skype, so we really appreciate you uh, joining us. Uh, you did get a couple of questions. Um, one of them, and this goes back to, I, I guess, some of your questions about teaching kids and the next generation of, of data scientists. Uh, there was a raging discussion at the last strata uh, over beers about whether we should stop teaching calculus in schools and instead start teaching uh, statistics because we live in a world where uh, the latter is more useful than the former. Um, Ali Rebe asked, do traditional BI analysts need to be mathematicians to be data scientists? In other words, what are the prerequisites to start a career in data science or big data, especially if you're already a BI guru who's trying to make the switch? Okay, sorry, I'm switching forth uh, and muting my speaker, so I'm trying to be as uh, flexible as possible. So I am living proof that you do not have to be a trained mathematician or a trained um, programmer to work in either uh, area. I have been implementing lightweight data mining through the Microsoft stack um, for uh, eight years. You have to be inquisitive. You, um, the key to data science, I think, uh, uh, this just said at the last strata conference, is you have to uh, be able to formulate uh, the correct questions and have the insatiable curiosity to, to want to get the correct answer. So I'm not going to lie to you that you have to have a, sort of a mathematical bent to uh, what you're doing, but I am living proof because I've been making my living doing uh, lightweight data science, if you will, for years. Um, I am not classically trained in statistics, so I don't know that I'd be qualified to answer how that would help, but I can tell you that um, uh, sort of core programming skills is uh, quite helpful, math skills quite helpful, um, and understanding of the, the business domain. I also think, and this has become probably because of my own bias, uh, being trained as a linguist, um, understanding and appropriately capturing the taxonomy and understanding basics of the business is something that actually uh, could go very far in terms of um, giving meaning to the information. Yeah, John Rouser mentioned it, uh, if I remember correctly, at Stroud New York, it was uh, statistics or mathematics, uh, engineering, writing skills, and skepticism in equal measure makes a data scientist. Yeah, I'd agree. So uh, one more quick question. Uh, you mentioned the 50 times multiple on your analysis of NoSQL versus traditional RDBMS, if I got that right. Um, Jefferson Braswell was wondering, is the cost multiple driven by SQL platform licensing versus open source? Is it because of resource requirements? Can you maybe give a little more detail on why that is? Well, I am just uh, observing. I'm not uh, setting this stuff up, but yeah, that would be my opinion. It's licensing, it's resourcing, um, you know, it takes more care to have DBAs, uh, whether they're in the data center or whether they're on premise. Um, I think in the slide that I, that I had comparing RDBMS and Hadoop, the suggested ratio was 1 to 30 or 1 to 40 for RDBMS and 1 to 3,000 for Hadoop. So it's dramatically different in terms of management because, of course, you don't get transactional consistency and all those things that you do get in RDBMS with NoSQL. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, the join comes at a very, it allows you to build things easily, but it comes at a really high cost behind the scenes in terms of scale out and redundancy. Yeah, and I also think there's more competitive pressure on the NoSQL side. 
um, you know, I included in my cost analysis things like Dropbox, which of course are not enterprise. But yet, if you are in the uh, business of storing something in non-relational storage, you've got a lot of different choices on the cloud. You have fewer choices that are, that are relational. So not enough competition, I think, is driving it as well. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Lynn. I apologize for running over, but uh, it looks like a lot of people wanted to stick around and, and hear what you had to say. So uh, um, we'll wrap things up for those guys. Um, thank you to all of the presenters today. Thank you again to Microsoft for making this possible. Hopefully that was useful uh, insight into how enterprises are going to adopt big data. Um, we'd love to see you join us at Strata Conference, which is coming up um, in, the, uh, in February, uh, February 28th to March 1st, 2012, at the Santa Clara Convention Center. Uh, that's out on the West Coast. We'd love to have you there, and if you're interested in signing up, you can go to strataconf.com and use today's online conference, OLC5, as a code, and you'll get 20% off those tickets. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to all of our presenters for being here today, and thanks to the team for uh, all the logistics behind the scenes that made this go smoothly. Have a great day. Yeah.